drone strikes. So big headline making news in their violations. But there are hundreds of thousands of treaties which are implemented like clockwork on a daily basis. No, but I think that international uh, states are obeying international. When it's peace time, whenever there is, there is a war or there is a conflict, uh, international always fails. Well, I mean, you, you make a point when you said there is law that applies and regulates armed conflict. How do you fight a war? There is international humanitarian law. That's exactly what we look at the conflict of That applies to how you fight a war. And they violate that. So, so technically violations do take place even, even inside a war. And I don't think we can find, come across a war in history where some violations of violence have not taken place. Right? Um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, so what was, what was your question again? That when it comes to, in peace time, you know, international law is followed. When it comes to uh, conflict, then it fails. Yes and no. I mean, often what we see is that there are wars which are legitimately entered into, okay? but not necessarily legitimately fought. Those are two different things. To enter into a war is known as use of force and the authority to enter into a war. You can't just say, oh, I don't like the face of the president of that country, so I'm going to invade it. That's illegal. There are rules against it. It's too orange for us. It's too orange for us, yes. Um, but, but that's illegal because you have Article 2.4 of the UN Charter which says that you cannot inter intervene in the affairs of another state. So armed intervention is there. Just one second. Um, but there are also lawful means. The three ways how you can, you're permitted to violate the sovereignty of another state or, or circumvent Article 2.4. One is that the Security Council authorizes you. So in the case of Libya, the UN Security Council issued uh, you know, an authorization to enter uh, Libya and its force there. So it wasn't a violation of international law. So you entered that war lawfully. What happened then may or may not have abided by the uh, by the international law, the laws of armed conflict. So you had a question. Yeah, no, what I was trying to say is that I agree with the criticism in the first part. It's not really law because powerful states can violate the law with impunity. Because if, for example, instead of the US, some other weak state had done the same thing, then the result would have been much different, in my opinion. So in that sense, I would agree with the principle. So you're saying that if a weaker state, for example, violated international law. would have been an uproar. I there would have been an uproar. Let's take me. So you're saying there would have been an uproar, but for the U.S. there would not be. There wasn't. They did their... Absolutely. No, I agree with you. When Iraq invaded Kuwait, you had the U.N., you had NATO and the, and, uh, the U.S. step in and impose uh, issues there. So the, you know, there are those things. We can't look at this mechanically like robots. You have law which is a formal, formalistic, mechanistic system. And we'd love to be able to look at it like a robot because we can then predict, okay, this is the law. If somebody violates the law, you have this result. But this is the international relations we're talking about. Right? Where some countries are powerful. Some countries do have nuclear weapons. And they have the ability to change the rules according to suit them. Exactly. So it's the nexus of these two things which not only makes this very challenging, but also personally, for, my, for me, very interesting. And it's, it's working in this environment, which is really what uh, motivates me uh, to this issue. So let's, let's just quickly get back to this. The reasons for its seeming ineffectiveness is that the incidents of failure are headline making news and are brought to our attention. Genocide of Kurds, Kashmir issue, Rwanda, Bosnia, US invasion of Iraq, Israel's continued occupation of Palestine. It's a headline making news. But what if they amounted to 0.01% of the implementation of international law? Would we still consider it? International as a failure? No. Not really. We might change our view. Okay. Um, so let's look at some evidence of international law as a system of law. Okay. First, states believe that international law exists. They conduct their, themselves in accordance with international law. So remember how we mentioned that, it, that, it, that law itself is a mechanism of social control? Right? So if states want to communicate at, at a big level, we have a mechanism of the UN, which is created by international law. A forum where they can bring their grievances or they can raise issues, come up with treaties, interact with each other. That's a form um, where states believe that international exists and so we should abide by those rules there. Diplomatic immunity. States believe that they should abide by the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations. Consular access. States believe that we should abide by the Vienna Convention of Consular Relations. Right? So the states believe that this exists. It isn't some 
mythical unicorn somewhere. International law is practiced on a daily basis in the foreign office, uh, foreign offices or ministries of external affairs around the world. And I've worked for a year at the Office of the Legal Advisor. Uh, I was an associate there, me and Jamal both. Uh, and we see how, how you know, the foreign office takes and actually generally appreciates international law. There's a huge capacity gap there. And we'll get to that right at the end of this. But it does exist. Um, and international organizations such as the UN, WTO, these only exist because of international law. International law created them. So uh, it functions in that way. International law is discussed and applied in national courts as well. Just domestically, let's look at the Kulbushan Yadav case. We have a domestic military court that is dealing with his international violations. And now, because the ICJ has imposed a stay on his execution, our courts and our system will adhere to that. They will not execute. So international law has an impact on the domestic legal process. The legal, big um, bilateral investment treaties that, that, that deal with it. So Jolly Ikhar Hussain in Supreme Court looked at the legal case. He looked at the international treaties which applied to it. He looked at the UN Convention Against Corruption. And that's why he held it eventually, the, the contract board, which is not going to bite us in the ass. But um, we might be liable for the But so let's see. Uh, Dr. Afya Siddiqui. Transfer of sentence, person treaties applies to this. Our courts have said bring her back. Um, the Peshawar High Court judgment on drones, it talks about the violation of uh, sovereignty in these issues and international law. Um, and the extradition case, Doggy Sadek, Ogras, can be used international extradition treaties to bring this guy back. I work on this case at the Foreign Office with um, the FIA as well. Alright, so we're, we're clear on this? The latest one. What is that battle? 001. 001. What is the latest decision on terrorism? The 21st Amendment case. Yes. Ah, 21st Amendment case talked about international humanitarian law applying in Pakistan for um, the operations that we are serving allowing military courts to take place because we're in a state of conflict for the of war and all those So absolutely, that's very good example. I'll put that in the slide. Uh, another memory point, and this is something important you guys need to grasp, is Article 38 of the ICJ statute. Because if anybody asks you, what are the sources of international law? Where do you get international law from? This is where it's defined. It's Article 38 of the ICJ statute. The court whose function it is is to decide in accordance with international law. Such disputes as are submitted to it shall apply. Internet 1 or A, international conventions, whether general or particular, establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states. Number 2, international custom is evidence of a general practice accepted as law. Number 3, the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. And 4, subject to the provisions of Article 9, judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists, basically academics. All right, so what we have here, we have international conventions, treaties, we have international custom or customary international law, then we have general principles recognized by civilized states. So estoppel, for example, is, sorry? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so these general principles are also applicable over within this, uh, you know, the, the international legal system. And finally, importantly, judicial decisions of national courts, but at a subsidiary level. And you also have the academic, uh, you know, the minds who work on this, their writings also have an impact. Because what we see is international law is an organic, developing, evolving system. And new law is created uh, regularly. It's, or, or new law is evolved regularly. And how this happens is that academics or, or people, you know, uh, students of the law, they come together and they, they come up with ideas, talk about it, write about it, discuss it, and then they come up with a new version. That look, now the US is violating sovereignty. Previously, it didn't use to violate sovereignty, but now with its drone, drone attacks, the US approach has changed. So now it's okay to violate sovereignty because states are doing it all the time. So our, the, the, the sanctity of sovereignty is now diluted after 9 11 because of this terrorism issue. Okay? So we can see how it's, it's already evolving right before our eyes. Are we clear on this? So this is just a diagram of that. Now, uh, treaties, custom, you have state practice and opinion jurists. We'll move to that in the next slide. That's what, a, what custom international law is. You have judicial decisions. 
then international as well as national, so you can apply ICJ decisions or the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia or Rwanda. You can have international arbitrations and their principles would also apply. And then you can have national decisions, academic writings. And then now what you also see is international organizations, resolutions passed by them or uh, their practices dictated. So, so, um, so like according to judicial decisions uh, in the national sphere, for, the, for example, like some case took place in the U.S., like state versus some other entity, and that decision could be used as a source of international law. Absolutely. Okay. So, if if uh, a, a domestic decision took place on anything, it can demonstrate two things. Right. One, uh, it can look at how the state views international law. Uh, whether it applies it in a particular context, whatever uh, the situation is. Secondly, it can also demonstrate what the state's position is on something. Because the judiciary, as we already looked at, is an arm of the state. So the judiciary might be independent on getting it. But it's still, its actions will be attributed to the state at the international plane. We're clear on that, right? So when they say Pakistan is in violation of international law or international human rights law, that would be true if even a court said that you know you have to give him the death penalty despite him being uh, a paraplegic or, or, or paralyzed, as uh, you know it's happened in Pakistan. So in that situation, the court itself, their decisions demonstrate or manifest what the state's position is on a particular issue, and that's why they're, they're important. Uh, over there. So basically, if I stand here, it works. But if I stand here, it doesn't. Work. So what is customary international law? Guys, I should have put an icon over here as well. Commit this to memory. This is extremely important because Jamal, um, Minahil, Zainab, they're all going to be discussing customary international law. It's important that you understand this. Okay. So we have written down treaties which we sign in the clear card, we know what they mean. You can also have custom traditions bind you legally. And you can bring those up in court as well. So these are known as customary international law. The two ingredients to make something, how do you know what a tradition is binding when it's just a habit, right? Um, we take off our shoes before going into a mosque. Now is this a legally binding requirement or is this out of respect? Out of respect. Do you, did you all know that in Masjid must, must Nabi, during the Prophet's time, people would enter with their shoes because they didn't have carpets there. You would, outside the mosque, just look under your feet, and if there wasn't any dirt or anything bad on it, you would enter the mosque and pray in your shoes. Right? This is what would happen. But now, we've changed. A custom almost has evolved, where if you don't take out your shoes, somebody will beat you. Right? We're clear on that. Um, so, so, we have to realize that it's, it's, it's two different things. It's, it's a custom developed by two ingredients. The first is state practice. That there is a consistent practice of states doing a particular act. Okay? They consistently do it, regularly do it. Um, there is repetition uh, over a consistent period of time. Again, this is an objective thing. You can outwardly determine this by looking at the state's actions, by looking at its statements, etc. Okay, objective element. There's also a subjective element. What the state feels itself. Not only must there be a regular practice. But the state must feel that when I do this, I do it out of legal obligation. That if I, do, if I don't do this, there will be legal consequences of my violation. Let's read the, the language here. The belief that an action was carried out because it was a legal necessity. Opinion jurist essentially means that the state must act in a compliance with the norm, not merely out of convenience, or habit, or coincidence, or political expediency but rather out of a sense of a legal obligation. Let's use an example here, diplomatic community. Okay. Now, it's fine and well to be very nice to an ambassador. If you were to arrest an ambassador, forget the Vienna Dip Convention of Diplomatic Relations. If you were to arrest an ambassador, you should expect that your ambassador, something's gonna to happen to him. So there are legal consequences that are gonna happen. Maybe somebody takes a case up at the ICJ or another issue happens. Right? So you feel legally bound that I'm not going to arrest the ambassador, he has diplomatic immunity, I'm not going to arrest him because it can also impact my state and there are legal consequences that would flow from this violation of international law. Okay? That's why I will regularly and feel legally obliged to 
give different magnitude to, to, to uh, MC equations there. So this is the subjective element there. It's the second thing. Uh, how do we determine this? How do we determine the thinking of a state? Anyone? Publications of what? The state. The state publication. Please show me this publication. Decisions of the board. Sorry. Or can't be okay for policies. I would have to go sit down with Sadhguru and ask him. Right? No. Where would you find these things? You're right. You're on the right track. You said judicial decisions. Absolutely. That's one source. Constitution. Constitution can be a source as well. Technically. Put your ambassador's statement at the UN. Okay. Um, your prime minister's statement at some summit or the foreign policy statement on the foreign, foreign office website, perhaps. These are all sources of how you determine your money goes, of how you determine uh, what uh, a state's position is and what its thinking is with regards to particular. So your statements on social media like Twitter, they come? Well, I guess now with Trump in power, everything <laughs> He's not going to jail for those things. <laughs> All right, so we've covered that. Very quickly, subjects of international law, states, international organizations like the UN, EU. This is to whom international law applies. Okay. We have corporations, multinational companies, oil companies. And why are we mentioning these? Because we have international investment law, under which investments in other countries are protected and maintained on the basis of this. <laughs> Um, so, so that's why they're also mentioned. And now individuals, and we see this more and more, we have individuals being affected by international treaties. So war criminals, you have the Geneva Convention, violations of that, you have the ICC which specifically deals with individuals, the International Criminal Court. Uh, pirates, slavers, um, and importantly it gives you human rights. So you can get protections and your state if it signs up to the complaint mechanism in certain treaties like the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, it has an optional protocol which a state can sign up to, and then an individual of that state can directly appeal to the UN and say, look, my right has been violated. Okay. So that's um, also important there. Now we talk about how international law affects you and I, and how it's, these are those things which we don't see, but apply like clockwork all the time. So you had a question? Yeah, so uh, regarding the uh, place where you say it's subjects, so if you count small corporations as the subject. And you said if the, the international law involves customary uh, like laws as well, tradition. So you mean the, if, when the law is made, it's flexible for a corporation in every other country because the, some of the custom of that country will apply to the firm. So it's good you mention that. So the customs of particular countries don't become international, customary international law. Most mulk under within their sovereign domain, they might be custom and the courts may apply. But outside of that, unless it is followed by, you know, a lot of countries or, or all those countries which are concerned in that, for example, they could be custom international relating to space, and Pakistan will have a very little role because we don't we're not a space faring nation, right? We send Babur or one or two satellites like that, but we don't make a lot of. So the main countries that will be dealing with custom international will be developing it would be the US, Russia, European Union, China, India. And these five countries could make the customary international law related to space. But generally you require like a general principle in a lot of countries. You can't just have So those laws when they will be made, they would be a little flexible or not? Because like if Yeah that's the that's the issue. Like the, determining the extent of customary international is not yeah. the easiest thing. Yeah. And that's where the extent is determined when a problem arises. And it goes to the ICJ, or it goes to some international tribunal or arbitration KDA. That's when the court determines whether customary international law exists and what extent it exists in that particular case. Right? So it's not very easy. It's problematic. One source that we that, that is helpful is uh, the, the writings of academics. They can say, look, we can determine from this you know, state of affairs for the past ten years that customary international law now has developed. That you can violate the country's sovereignty on the, for the purposes of terrorism. Etc. Whatever. Right? I'm just making a, a thing. Okay, always knowing what time and date it is, anywhere in the world, is because of the International Meridian Conference of 1884, where they said the Prime Meridian goes through Greenwich in the UK, and you have. Don't make me. 
ready. I'm just 